Right, hello everybody. Welcome to our two weekly department seminar. We've had a little bit of a longer hiatus. We've had three weeks since our last one, it's just to synchronize some dates. But thanks for everybody who's attending today. Um, before we get started, I just want to uh, say that if you would like CPD points uh, for attending the seminar, please simply email me your HPCSA registration number. I'm going to put my email in the chat group. So just copy my email address and then send me your HPCSA registration number. You don't need to send me anything else. And then I'm going to hand over to Professor Steve Reed, who's also our head of department, who's going to introduce today's speaker. So go ahead, Steve. Thanks, Jeroen, and welcome everybody uh, to this uh, seminar series, which we've started in this new department of family, community and emergency care. Um, and I'm particularly happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Louis Jenkins, who's well known in the Garden Root area and, and known to many of you. But um, uh, the reason that I asked uh, Louis to um, present this topic was really the idea that um, palliative care uh, and emergency care have a lot more to do with each other than we might have thought. And so rather than working in silos, uh, in discipline bound silos, uh, what we're striving to do in this new department is really to work across disciplines, particularly those in uh, the arena of primary care or district based health systems, health uh, systems. Um, and I think the more synergy that we can get, the better. And this seemed to be a particularly good example of that. Um, because I think we are always uh, more, we can be more than the sum of the parts if we, um, if we do more of this integrative kind of work. So um, Louis runs the emergency department and the uh, emergency center and the family medicine department at uh, George Regional Hospital, has been there for, gosh, how many years, Louis? You can tell us, many years, part of the furniture, and is an uh, uh, honorary uh, appointment at both Stellenbosch and UCT uh, in family medicine. So welcome, and uh, over to you, Louis. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, so, and thank you for the opportunity to, to, to talk um, to all our colleagues at UCT. I see many familiar names. So yeah, I feel at home. Yeah, since you've asked me, Steve, many months ago, hey, to, to, you know, to, to give a sort of a talk, and, and, and I remember you saying um, how it looks on the ground, you're a sort of front line. How, how does palliative care and emergency medicine um, find each other? Um, yeah, so I so so the idea, of the the focus of my talk this afternoon will be to give a to give a sort of a family medicine perspective from from George Hospital. Um, I I'm gonna actually show just quickly briefly go through four typical cases that we see every day, and then also um, just just uh, go through an article that we actually recently published on. The contribution of palliative care to to the emergency center. I wonder if I should switch off my video, uh, uh, unless it's flowing all right. I can keep it on. Maybe, yeah, maybe I can. Just no problems this side, Louis. We can hear you and see you perfectly. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm going to leave it on. Okay. Um. So, yeah. Let's move. Let's see if the slides move. Um. How does it move forward? Come on. Hmm. Stop my video because something's no no try uh, try your space bar or try the right arrow key. It's slow, it doesn't want to do that page down. It sort of doesn't move to the next slide. I want right arrow key doesn't move. Um try bottom left, Louis. No. My word. Uh, let me. No, it's not moving. It's a full screen. Ah, oh, there we go. 
Okay. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yeah, good. So yeah, that's just to, to show people the, the perspective is really the George sub-district, uh, which includes from you know, affluent areas right up the mountain right over to large areas of, of more low and middle income um, communities. There's no district hospital in George, as you know. Um, so George Hospital is the regional district hospital. Um, it, it made me think how to summarize sort of what happens in care, as we all know, and it fits uh, our department also of family, community, and emergency care. But it moves from, you know, there's a sort of continuum from preventative care that at times becomes acute care, uh, which at times then becomes chronic, um, or acute care becomes emergency, and then chronic also becomes emergency. And, and from emergency care, where we're sitting, if you situate yourself in the emergency center, you hope to get back to chronic care uh, up, or of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a chance of cure to the bottom left, or um, sometimes emergency care leads to, to palliative care outcome, or uh, recently I had to remind myself even organ donation uh, in terms of death. Um, and, then, and then palliative care, goes on to end of life care. But sometimes when you have a, palliative, a patient with palliative care needs, they, they can bounce back to have some acute care needs um, and then sort of enter the cycle again, some chronic components, emergency again, palliative care. So there's this, so it's not a, it's not a linear process. It's, it's a little bit circular or even spiral if you like. This also illustrates a little bit the relationship between curative treatment and palliative treatment. Um, you know, at the time of diagnosis, uh, patients, we, we should start palliative treatment together with curative treatment for the sort of diseases mentioned at the bottom there. You can see the red, the red dotted line for cancer uh, and then the blue for the end stage chronic illnesses like heart failure or renal failure or even HIV and it, right at the bottom sort of dementia trajectory. So, you know, uh, so this is very typical. It also helps to explain this to patients and to our, to our staff how, for example, heart or renal failure, patients go, go down and then they bounce back a little bit, but not right back to baseline. And as you move over time to the right, of course, the importance of curative treatment becomes less and less, while palliative treatment becomes more and more uh, important. So these patients present uh, several times and it's quite difficult how to find that balance between less and less curative and more and more palliative uh, until you eventually have end of life care and death. So I'm just going to take us through four patients quickly because you know we can talk a little bit theoretical uh, but these, these patients we see every day in fact I stopped, I stopped uh, um, preparing cases and taking photos because there's just every day, you know, you see a couple of patients and I, I get the, I see that that happens in most of our district hospitals and, and I presume the other regional hospitals also, but just somebody with a, with a stroke and then cancer and then a patient with HIV TB and a patient with COPD. So, this patient arrived in June, one Saturday midnight, 47 year old, the usual hypertension, but no other illnesses. And he presented to our emergency center with a glass coma scale of eight out of 15. So you must imagine yourself either as a Cosmo, a junior doctor with the nurses there at midnight. This is, this is the patient that the ambulances bring in, obviously to the resuscitation area, you can see on the back there, at least the saturation is, is pretty fine, 97%. Should you intubate this patient or not? GCS 8, but a little bit further, you start seeing, okay, the blood pressure is particularly high. It's really a hypertensive emergency. Bradycardia, so this patient is getting into trouble, probably slowly coning. We do the usual emergency care. In this case, run a labetalol infusion. Make sure we optimize temperature, sugar, oxygen, and position. But um, yeah, CT scan shows shows a massive uh, hemorrhagic infarct with uh, you can see vasogenic edema there and brain swelling. So suddenly 
you move across from an emergency medicine mindset to a more palliative care, probably at this stage, probably, but you, you start thinking, okay, the emergency can be fixed. So con we contact the family, contact the daughter, we discuss with our colleagues in internal medicine, discuss with neurosurgery at Grote Skier, is there further intervention to be done? So the consensus is now, this patient is for rehab or palliative care really, with that degree of bleed. So for admission to, to family medicine ward. But uh, he unfortunately demised a few hours later in, in the EC. So you can just get a sense of how swiftly that night moved for the patient and for the attending physicians. But we also see the best part of, uh, of the job. Um, this patient actually presented midday, really, just here at work, the 66-year-old, 36-year-old lady, married, four children, no illnesses. She smokes, but no alcohol. She just felt dizzy at work, weak in her left arm and leg, and she came in with a dense left hemiplegia and an upper motor near on seven. So we were in the three hour period of, uh, of, 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 uh, um, of fibrinolysis. So we had an urgent CT scan, which showed a ischemic stroke and we uh, thrombolyzed it with actylase. And this is a photo of her the next day, 24 hours later, she recovered completely. So that's the, that's the spectrum of, 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 sort of patients with strokes uh, as we all know it. But this is just some recent examples. So the next patient is a 58-year-old patient brought in by EMS to our EC from the local community. Uh, he's got a 39-year-old partner, no children, with, the, with the, the complaint that I cannot take in foods or fluids, short of breath, blood coming out of his mouth. And he was actually known with squamous carcinoma of the tongue with metastasis on chemotherapy. And his next follow-up date was in five days with Onco. So a bit more history, he also has previous TB, hypertension, the observations you can see, the significant thing is the saturation, that's 78%, but he was cachectic, although he was fully conscious and talking to us, but generally very weak. So we did the usual e emergency medicine care of uh, giving um, ringer's lactate fluid, morphine, IVI for pain, some blood investigations. This is another difficult area. Uh, the more you sort of have the palliative care mindset, mindset you, you don't do blood tests, but if you're in an emergency medicine mindset, then you still do blood tests. And if you think you may be, ref be referring to in, in a department like internal medicine, but you can see there, there's quite a pre-renal picture there. We discussed him with the surgeons for possible PEG tube and with oncology the next morning. And we admitted him to family medicine ward for the multidisciplinary team which uh, managed the patient in the ward. Um, this is our team of social worker and Dr. Margie Munnings. I think she's also on the call actually. And our medical officer in the ward and our sister looking after the patient. So there's, so there's this seamless referral flow from, from the community via EMS into EC and then after the initial uh, emergency care into family meds ward, into the palliative care multidisciplinary team. Right, so here's our third patient brought in. Uh, you can see this sort of midday uh, with via EMS with the complaint of, so he's coming in from primary health care with weakness, it's actually a, a lady, weakness, pallor, and um, late with chronic medication. I wonder, do we, I hope we teach our students how the approach to a patient with weakness, pallor, and late with chronic medication, because this is not an uncommon sort of complaint package. Patient is on ARVs, TB, triage is orange. Um, so immediately, uh, it, you know, sort of into that mindset of, well, here is an orange patient brought in by the ambulance. Um, the HP is 6.8, so that's one significant thing down below that you can see, and also the pulse rate of 123 worries a bit. But this patient is 44 year old. She's got four children. She's a single mom. She's, if you look uh, on the electronic patient record, you see oh, she's, she's got a retroviral disease. She's on TLD with a low CD4 count and quite a high viral load uh, three months ago. 
She also has had previous TB and she's currently on TB treatment. That started one month ago and she spent some time in the local TB hospital. This is such a typical patient. I mean, every day, I won't be exaggerating if I'm saying there's at least two such patients, but certainly one. For sure, we diagnose two open TB patients every day in our EC uh, currently. Uh, but th this patient is really a um, very common presentation. Um, she's, she's for the complaints were general body weakness, poor appetite for a week, dyspnea obviously. And there was some reduced air entry on the right. You can see there's a small pneumothorax and, some, and a small effusion. Otherwise, nothing. Splenic sonar also showed some uh, micro abscesses. If you on further history and examination, uh, the, the, you, she also had, has been diagnosed with cervix cancer, stage 2B, uh, for which she received a radiotherapy a year ago. And two months ago, she started with uh, chemotherapy. And she missed her follow up appointment of two weeks prior. So this is also typically what happened, that, that sort of movement of patients between uh, the community and uh, a specialist department like gynae, uh, and then oncology, and then they sort of get sicker, and then they, be be they become an emergency. They come to EC, they miss follow-up appointments because they are sicker. They miss the usual follow-up, but then they present to EC, um, and then the whole cycle starts again. So the differential was obviously RVD, stage four, cervix cancer, stage 2B, abdominal TB with those microabscesses and the small pneumothorax on the right. We gave her one unit of blood because her baseline seems still to be good. Uh, all her TB workup was quite negative, A AFB, TB culture and gene expert. Um, so we referred her for admission uh, to the gynae team and we actually initiated palliative care. Um, I must say, she's lost a follow-up. I couldn't quite track down exactly um, her further uh, trajectory. The last patient uh, came in quite recently, actually. He was a 43-year-old man known with COPD, secondary to smoking, which is ongoing. And he, he had an MMRC grade 3 uh, um, classification for the COPD. In other words, shortness of breath at 100 meters has to stop. His last admission to family medicine was a month ago. So these patients come in frequently, frequently. This is quite long, one month. And he was now back with an acute exacerbation. And he was in, on blood gas in type 2 respiratory failure with a GCS of 9. So we had him in a recess area in the EC. You could see there on the right the BiPAD machine that we, uh, um, the Cosmo that worked the night, gave him a trial of five hours with a BiPAD machine. This would be the usual um, uh, approach before we discuss with any department. You see there's a, a response to BiPAP. Um, we gave him continuous NEPs, hydrocortisone, keftriaxone. His PCO2 slightly improved from 11 to 9, but his pH remained around 7.28. Uh, gene expert, negative five days ago. Sputum culture, five days ago from the clinics, just mixed flora. So basically this patient remained unconscious and we admitted into our family medicine ward and we started withdrawing by PAB and initiated palliative care. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was just for patients, just to give, give us a sense of, yeah, this is, this is typical for emergency physicians um, working in ECs in our province. Um, and so we, we, we had a look actually a year just over a year ago, at what actually is the contribution of palliative care to, to our emergency center. Recently, this article published Chris Strauli, he's a registrar now in emergency medicine at UCT, and Nardis Drummer also, and myself, um, looked at this work. Just a bit of background it uh, issues are increasingly uh, seeing patients requiring palliative and end of life care. I don't think that's a secret. Uh, and 50% of cancer patients visited the EC during the last six months of life. Repeat visits are very common, and the common comorbidities are cardiovascular, cancer, and lung conditions. As people know, apart from the national HIV TB uh, leaders in mortality, uh, in the Western Cape, diabetes and cardiovascular disease are now the, the, the mortality leaders, and we see those patients the whole time. So in South Africa, it's also we have an increasing older population, HIV, TB, and these 
a rising rates of hypertension, diabetes, and malignancies. We're seeing younger and younger strokes. I mean, we're seeing 18 year old, 20 year old, 30s patients coming in with, with strokes. So I think it's important to, to just realize palliative care as the clinical speciality is now well established, and it's also true for emergency medicine. And there, there is some work actually that came out of out of uh, Skir, well, out of actually well, out of Cape Town that showed that if you institute palliative care services in and outpatient, you do decrease admission rates and length of stay. And so there's a, there's a, there's quite a cost in, cost saving to that. Locally in the Garden Route, we developed the rural palliative care model in 2018 which started as a hospital-based system. But, you know, at the time, we didn't know much about how palliative care and emergency medicine interface with one another. It's not much data on that, certainly locally. So we wanted to describe the contribution of patients with palliative care needs to the caseload of an EC in jaws. The four objects was to estimate the prevalence of patients, these patients to describe some of their demographics and diagnosis, to understand the attending reasons and the disposition. From the EC. We got ethics approval and Western Cape Department of Health approval uh, and this was a prospective descriptive study. I think the setting is important so sorry for a full slide but it struck me uh, um, also when I spoke to, uh, um, to, to um, the, go the governor to, to um, pardon, governor uh, a while back that our, our our, our ECCs, of course, walk-in patients as well as emergency patients. It's not, it's not a sort of a typical medical or surgical or trauma unit. Um, it's, a, it's a 266 bed regional hospital with all the general specialities. There's 10 outlying district hospitals and uh, the, the EC is the primary, secondary and tertiary facility, especially after hours for jewels. There's about 250,000 people. Uh, the bigger area is Central Karoo and the Garden Route is around 700,000 people. The EC has 14 doctors, 20 nurses, four consultants, and we see about 4,500 patient visits per month. I must also just qualify the 14 doctors are, I actually can almost say they are not by the majority on full time, 40 or plus 16 overtime hours. More and more of our doctors, particularly the young doctors, some are on 20 hours, some are on um, 30 hours, some are on 40 hours, some are on 12 hours. So many, many are just on shorter three-year sessions, uh, which, which suits their flexible lifestyles. And of course, the EC covers all the clinical specialties. Then there's one private hospital in town, there's an NGO step-down facility, Bethesda, and then there's three NGOs that provide some palliative care service in the community, also through a network of community health workers. The study population included all patients attending the EC uh, that, that's entered into an online information system, HECTUS, uh, and all patients get an ICD-10 diagnosis and then a secondary diagnosis, for example, palliative care, Z51.5, or a mechanism of injury diagnosis, etc. Uh, the little color diagram on the right is a typical picture. Every month, our stats shows about half of patients, slightly more actually, uh, often is yellow and about a quarter orange and a quarter green and a, and a small sliver is, is really red. So our biggest patient load uh, revolves actually around yellow green because many yellows are actually green and quite a few greens are yellow. So that's a sort of a mixed bag of, of, of what we see. Um, this is just for noting, I don't have to go through it, but we, we work with the epidemiology and biostack division at Stellenbosch University to calculate a sample size, which they gave us guidance on. And then the data collection happened over three months from November 2020 to January 2021. Um, all patients were assessed and by a shift doctor, and we used the shortened palliative care identification tool and the SPICT tool. Uh, recently, uh, Renee Kraus and team they just published the SPICT South Africa variation on the SPICT tool, which stands for Supportive and Palliative Indicator Tool uh, to identify patients. 
the tool asks this question, would you be surprised if the patient were to die in the next year? And there's seven criteria. So, and patients that we identified as needing palliative care then received a second the ICD-10 code. So, how did we sort of try to grab, to, to make sure we get as many of the cases as possible? Uh, we had weekly training sessions. There was huge um, awareness and presence of palliative care in the unit. We put up yellow posters everywhere. We had twice daily during our hand over ward rounds. We reminded the staff of the palliative care study happening. Um, and then once patients were identified, their electronic patient records that as it's captured on ECM were reviewed to validate the diagnosis and determine the reason for attendance. And we looked at a, ver a number of variables, diagnosis, demographics, reason for EC visit, uh, whether it's physical or psychological or health system or social related, and then the disposition that they go home or whether admitted or did they pass away or they refer to a care facility. We excluded patients who were incorrectly coded uh, and who were younger than 18 and if there was insufficient medical records. So the principal investigator accessed the HECTUS database and filtered out all patient recordings during the study period with a palliative care code. Uh, and this data extracted from HECTUS was captured in an Excel spreadsheet and analyzed with SPSS software. Um, just also for internal validity, we just took 100 patient files from the total easy, easy visit for November in a random method and re reviewed all of them to, to, to see if they met the criteria for palliative care. And so of this 100 files pulled, there were only six that actually we afterwards correctly identified as requiring palliative care and then were coded as such. So the remaining folder did not meet the criteria. So we felt we, had, we could sort of assume a 90% accuracy in the sampling. I mean, we were under no illusion. You, the data is only as good as it's been entered. So the um, probably many patients are actually needing palliative care were not coded as palliative care, but at least what we got is those were definitely coded and we just did, did this check. So the results, 426 patient visits were identified as requiring palliative care over the three month period. This translates to about 4.24% of the total patient visits to the EC, um, which is about 10,000 patients. It's more, it was more or less constant over the three months, 4.4 and 3.5%. Um, one patient was excluded because of under 18 and 31 were excluded because they did not meet the shortened palliative care screening to criteria. The mean age of patients were 58 years with a normal distribution. Fre females were slightly more frequent at 55%. And patients with cardiac, neurolog ne neurological or dementia diagnosis were a bit older than the average in the 60s and 70s for dementia. And those with HIV or TB were necessarily younger at 40 and 38. The diagnosis, the major quarter of the patients um, came in with cancer and then next was a neurological uh, illnesses, mostly strokes, uh, head injuries, uh, and then HIV at 17%, respiratory at 70%, TB at 14, you know, it's difficult sometimes it was it the respiratory could be COPC or old TB um, or other reasons, but TB 14, dementia 14, and then lower down cardiac and renal. Most of the patients attended because of physical symptoms, particularly pain and dyspnea. Um, still by and large, the top reason why patients phone an ambulance uh, in the last few months of their life and they come in and they spend the night or a day in EC because of pain or dyspnea. I mean, social reasons about 11% and health systems related, 10%. Um, so social reasons would be people are failing to cope with, the, with their family member and health systems could be medicines that's run out or poor access, you know, couldn't get to the clinic, etc. Um, of course, it doesn't add up to 100 because some patients had more than one reason. 
to fourteen EC. This position from the EC, fifty-five percent of patients at end of life went home, which which we thought was um, positive. Twenty-six percent were admitted to to the wards, mostly to family medicine, but also to other departments. Thirteen percent passed away in the EC, and six percent were referred to the care facility in town. Either it would be Bethesda step down facility and some would be referred to um, Harikumai TB hospital if they had active TB and there was a bed and they went to medically sort of unstable, mostly Bethesda. So a few words on, uh, to discuss the results. So almost 5% of EC visits were by patients requiring palliative care. Uh, and as I explained, probably un under, Un, probably underreported. Um, uh, um, you know, the main reason was was physical pain, um, and that uh, yeah yeah. Sorry, I wanted to say you know I had a conversation with Rada Governor a while back. Remy Kraus put me in touch with her because she also did a study at Kruteski, but I think that was mostly in the, the medical um, EC, and she found a significant high. I think. She's, I think she means that 30% of patients were actually uh, also co-diagnosed as needing palliative care. So yeah, the, 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 the many more patients than we think are actually going through our ECs needing palliative care. 10% um, were system related. Um, and this is also potentially avoidable if you think about it. Um, for example, typical things requiring procedures such as urine catheter change. So there is a space also to engage primary health care more, and some attend due to caregivers feeling overwhelmed or unable to, to continue, um, and they need a respite care. Yeah, more than 50% of patients uh, were discharged home. So just a few words, what's happened since we started our local palliative care project in 2018? Because the focus, one of the main focus has been to try and care for patients in the community, and in their homes, as you can see here, a, a typical home visit with our palliative care doctor, Dr. Mannings, with uh, one of our sisters, Sister Fritinten, and another sister and uh, from Bethesda, and uh, a patient being cared for really fantastically in, in, in their home. Oh, hospital trolleys don't look like that. But so this patient it needs full care and is getting that at home. Um, so what we've set up is um, there's a there's a there's a guide to all our to health workers in the EC what to do if patients with palliative care uh, come to the EC twice daily during our huddle we have a, a standard script to ask are there any palliative care patients so twice a day we that's one of the priority indicators asking you know uh, with any absconders any any patients dying any crises any adverse incidents. Um, then um, we used the SPIC SA2 for screening, very nice that that's been published now. And then we have a one page referral letter to the palliative care email group. And we have weekly marketers from the team palliative care hospital war grounds. And then there's home visits by the community of workers and um, our family medicine palliative care doctor. She's in a session of both doing more than so yeah, a few just just this prompted me to to look at what 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 is the narrative out there in the bigger world on this sort of local experience. Many of you will be familiar with the choosing wisely um, um, initiative, where thousands of organisations have sort of uh, put together um, best evidence care and what does not work. So here's just three big uh, societies, the Australian and New Zealand Society of Pell Medicine, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and the American College of Emergency Physicians. All three have published more or less the same thing. Basically, don't delay discussion of and referral to palliative care for a patient with serious illness just because they are pursuing disease-directed treatment. Um, and there's three nice uh, websites to visit. Just a bit further on the American College of Emergency Physicians, 
emergency physicians should engage patients who present to the E department with chronic or terminal illness and their families in conversations about palliative care and hospice services. Early referral from the emergency department to hospice and palliative care services can benefit select patients, resulting in improved quality and quantity of life. This is quite a strong statement from the emergency physicians. And um, there's a very nice link to this podcast that that uh, that asks two emergency physicians um, their their experience with communication and grief in the emergency department in the states is Naomi George and Kay Romero, two very um, fascinating people to listen to. It's a bit long, forty five minutes, but it's it's completely worth it. In fact, I like the um, the big synergy that you find between between um, emergency physicians and family physicians and particularly palliative care physicians is that we we feel comfortable in the area of difficult conversations and particularly uncertainty. Um, this article by Auchi and, and others on managing code status conversations for seriously older adults in respiratory failure makes the point that during the last six months of life, three quarters of old, older people visit the EC. So these people come in and we see it more and more and they, how to find that balance between curative care and palliative care, that huge gray area of uncertainty. Um, th this is an area actually of expertise, I think where palliative care and um, emergency people can say, okay, we, we understand uncertainty because quite often our patients leave our hands and we're still not 100% sure what exactly is the cause of their headache or abdominal pain or fatigue. There were some limitations to the study because obviously it was during the COVID period. So actually our, our EC attendance went down because of course we were telling all our patients to rather stay home. So another reason why we that 4% is probably underreported and of course January, we got new EC interns and Cosmos, so they probably missed quite a few palliative care patients also. So in conclusion, about 5% of easy visits were by patients requiring palliative care. So we need to, to upskill our staff from acute to palliative care. Pain and dyspnea, most common. It makes one ask you what are the roles of family medicine, primary health care, and the community in managing pain and dyspnea. Uh, more than half went home, and we think a fun the functioning community-based palliative care service may have facilitated this position uh, strongly, it really helps. And so, you know, there's a place to advocate for well-functioning home-based palliative care to, to sort of alleviate pressures on ECs and allow for patient-centered palliative care. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Dewey. Yes, man. Oh. Steve, do you want to field the questions? Sure, I can do. That was really excellent, fascinating, and uh, evidence-based and also uh, patient-based. Thanks, Louis. Very nice uh, presentation. Open for questions. I must say I was, I was surprised at the four point whatever percent seemed lower to me, as you say, it may be underreported and it was during COVID. So um, uh, how did that compare with international literature? Have other studies been done elsewhere? Um, yeah, the, the thing is a lot, uh, it's very difficult to compare apples with apples, Steve, because, because our EC is really also an OPD after hours. So, so we couldn't find studies that really show that for a sort of an open EC, that's also a after our primary healthcare clinic, what is the exact, yeah. and then it's also difficult to, to decide end of life palliative care. So I think mm. we, we, we realize that this is a very low number and the, almost the biggest outcome of the study was an increased awareness mm. of palliative care patients, and I think also an increased acceptance uh, amongst EC staff, because maybe four or five years ago, 
there was a there was a there was a sort of a resistance against mm -hmm. patients coming in after hours in a busy EC and there's nothing to do for them. You know why? Yeah. Why? So 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 we're fully aware that this is hopelessly underreported, but at least now there is a complete acceptance of palliative care, a comfort with patients, and and really a care for palliative care patients. But so I think another prospective study. Um, using the speak SI tool will will give a significant higher prevalence. Were you saying basically that it's because your denominator was uh, so large, yeah. your your monthly throughput, you you coping with you dealing with everything across the board, primary, secondary, tertiary, probably level uh, services, yeah. There's yeah. no filter. Yeah, you know, ex exactly. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's quite tricky to find exact similar hospital settings elsewhere that did such studies because most, most, a lot of people have OPDs after hours or there's a CHC um, and then you have a, a dedicated trauma unit or medical emergency unit. Yeah. yeah. Go for it, Jerry. Louis, thanks for the great uh, talk. Um, uh, in terms of how you guys have managed to, to integrate this palliative care into the EM and, and, and working together so uh, well, how, what are your insights in terms of how you've achieved that in your hospital and how that could be implemented in other centers? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, great question, Julian, because um, I, I've, I've often thought, and I'm very, I was very pleased that somehow it happened. <laughs> I, I think, I think it helps to have a steady team of doctors and nurses in in the EC, because uh, the turnover of people, um, you you have a sort of a mechanical team that just wants to learn procedures and move on, and uh, so we've been we've been having. Because we've been broken down, we, we've been breaking down 56 hour posts into two to three posts. We've, we've, kept, we've kept many of our doctors now in the EC for a number of years. So, mm -hmm. and then with that group, we've done training, palliative care training. We, we've done this sort of, just a, just a brief certificate five day course. So a lot of our staff in the EC have done that training. And I think the third, the third, well, maybe the, there's another one, but the third component has been uh, role modeling, you know, so that one is aware family and emergency physicians and the nurses that you don't, you don't stop for a long time with a patient with an MI or, you know, an acute problem. And then when you move on during your ward rounds in East seat and there's a palliative care patient that you just skip over, you know, oh, this is palliative care uh, and that you, you give the same attention you obviously change gears completely. Is this patient got sufficient pain control? Have we had a conversation with the family? Have we excluded the reversible causes? What is the patient wishes, admi admission or going home? And just treating everyone with the same respect, whether, you, whether you've got an, a you know, tonsillitis or you, 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 you end of life, has shown, I think, the, the, the team, okay, this is how we treat people. I think a final thing is there is, of course, a lot of emphasis and energy around palliative care now globally, nationally, and in our province. So that's also very encouraging to have that support. Yeah. Uh, Renee, and there's a question from Hammond in the chat. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Louis. And I think it's so important okay. during the week of palliative care that you've actually oh. done this and presented this. So thank you very much. And I think also to your team that you are really looking at integrating palliative care in a more rural setting, not that George is rural, but also to think about how we are, are ensuring that palliative care is not just available in the, the sort of city centers, um, but also in the rural setting. My question to you is, you know, you sort of talked about the awareness of palliative care in your setting and that you've normalized it. So firstly, I want to look at, has there been any staff that there were sort of barriers to normalizing palliative care in an acute setting and any sort of 
barriers from management or anyone like that, that you were bringing sort of an NGO type of previous NGO care setting into an acute setting. And how do you think we can start measuring outcomes of these patients? Because um, we measure a lot of the outcomes of our other patients, but it will be so important to actually see integrating palliative care in the EC, does it actually improve the outcomes of these patients and their families? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Renee. Some good questions. And I think you are, sorry, I didn't, but I, I, I believe you also gave a talk this morning. I hope it went well. But as you say, it's all in the sort of celebrating World Palliative Care Day. And next week in Hermanus, also, there, there'll be some talks. We'll also have a team going there. I'm sure others in the room also. Um, getting to your questions, barriers. I must say, management was fantastically supportive of, of palliative care. I, I've, I've never experienced resistance. Um, it's interesting in terms of acute care. I can, if I can answer you, even in a, in another way. For example, we had a we had a situation where a, a mother had a medical termination of preg, a, a pregnancy, and the fetus was four hundred grams, and took eight hours to pass away. But the, the ops and gynae team really, really felt it, they really didn't have adequate skills how to handle that end of life scenario that, that mother sitting with her fetus of 400 grams for eight hours. And um, it wasn't handled as well as we could have at all because of this sort of hospital-based medical medical care model, you know, if is it for ventil, you know, if for incubator or not, for breastfeeding or not. Um, and in fact, in fact, the gynae department asked asked me, could I have, so I had four sessions with the nurses and doctors and cleaners in Ops and Gynae. And, and really it was just getting back to what does it mean to be human? How do we just be with patients? Um, and and, 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 and just, just recover some humanity in this sort of technocentric, hospice-centric uh, environment that, that large hospitals have become. But I think what was encouraging to me is like I said to them, I'm not an expert in palliative care, like, you know, Renee, you guys, but we see it every day. So we've become comfortable with end of life conversations with patients. Um, the same has happened in pediatrics. So I think, I think there's an acceptance in the hospital that this is a reality. More and more people are, all the partners have end of life. And I think um, Margie can also comment if she's in the if she's in the call. But initially, we did have re resistance from clinical departments more more than from management. So some of the clinical departments, when we started our weekly ward rounds in the hospital, and we went to internal medicine, surgery, you know, peds, and we said, "Do you have patients at end of life palliative care that you would like the multidisciplinary to see?" And initially, it was no, 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 no. Of course not. Because I mean, you know, you shouldn't be having such patients in your level two acute beds, of which you only have about 23. But then we would say, but this patient here and this patient here. But so after when they started seeing the value that the MD team adds, you know, we we reduce uh, medication burden, we optimize pain control, we have bedside conversations with the family. Uh, and, and listening to their needs and not the hospital's needs, like for a bed, you know, they've realized, but they, they managed to discharge patients in a far happy, you know, patients are happy to go home, that they don't return that quickly. Um, they, so we are now fully accepted in the hospital. In fact, now we had to say to all the partners, please don't send us all your palliative care patients. You've all been trained and exposed to palliative care. You can also manage it by far yourself. And so we had to cut back a bit because we've been getting, been getting so many palliative care referrals. Your last question, just to briefly answer of measuring impact or outputs, I think too immediately uh, low hanging fruit is the fact that most patients are going home and, and from stats from home visits, most patients now prefer to, to die at home. They don't all reflexively phone the ambulance and come to the hospital. So that sort of inferring that that they 
they accepting home home based care, etc. And they they they've moved a little bit away from that. Go to the hospital for a drip, you know. Um, but yes, we we need to look at that in more depth. Exactly the contribution. Yeah, I hope that answers more or less. Right? So, Lou, there's some things in the chat uh, from Tim and from class. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I'm opening the chat, or you want to read it, Steve? Um, yeah. Uh, Hamas is just asking what was the percentage of patients out of yet yellow, orange, and red triage? Oh, is that the quiz? Oh, percentage of paleo? Oh, no, no. I didn't. We didn't look at that. Sorry. Okay. And then classes uh, comments. Um, what were the enabling factors to facilitate barriers encountered? Oh, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think a big thing was just a systematic uh, presence and role modeling of, of um, approaching palliative care patients the same way you would approach any other patient. Uh, but with appropriate care, you don't say about let's take some bloods. You rather ask the patient what what can I do for you now? You know, um, and and having that conversation a few times. Don't get exasperated. But but surely they told you you've got cancer. No, you don't do that. You you just understanding palliative care and offering palliative care to lots of our staff. I wonder also maybe the younger doctors coming in. There's a shift perhaps in undergrad education. I, I seem want to believe that. That 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 so the whole environment is slowly changing. But yeah, I, I also think that constant factor, just having a family medicine um, team in the hospital that that all had, have the same approach in mind and over time role model that kid. Yeah. When we did our ward rounds, for example. We, we always insist that the ward doctor is there. So you have an MO or an intern from surgery or, or, or internal medicine ops and gynae who presents their patients to the MD team. And, mm. then, and then they see how we, you know, I mean, a typical thing, you know, sit down at the level of the patient in the bed. Don't talk over the patient. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing. Small, small things just show this is what respect means. This is what biopsychosocial approach means, you know? Yeah. Peter? Uh, hi, Louis. Uh, hi, thanks Peter. for that. Um, a great presentation. Um, I've been holding off, hoping that one of my more clinical EM colleagues would say something, but I seem to be the voice of emergency medicine just to to yeah to congratulate you and say that this is a a key topic uh, it was really steve and possibly steve through you that opened my eyes when we did a ward round at one of our regional hospitals in cape town and after the first row of major patients he turned back and said you realize that 60 percent of the patients we've just seen are palliative and shouldn't be right here so <laughs> it, it's been a learning process for me and for all of us um Katya Evans is a huge proponent of this, and yeah. she's not here. She yeah. told me she'll be listening to the recording in earnest. Um, but yeah, I, I, on the one hand, I feel like George is quite a unique um, environment, and your emergency center has always run on its own feet and, and has integrated family medicine and obstetrics and had a friendly management. But there's no reason this couldn't be replicated everywhere. And yeah, getting the word out to our colleagues and even the deanery who are only just realizing that emergency medicine isn't just elbow deep in blood all day is, mm. is going to happen. No, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I echo all your thoughts there. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you uh, for the presentation. I joined a little bit late, but mainly because I'm still on the floor. Um, I'm from Kailicha, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the EM physicians here. And I was just looking at some of our numbers and, and how necessary this is in our EC, is that in the last two years, we've had 453 natural deaths in our EC. And everyone thinks of us as the trauma, <laughs> the trauma center. We've only had 126 unnatural deaths. You know, that was, if we exclude our dead on arrivals. 
Mm. And so that means a lot of people are dying in our EC and, and the care that we give and what we're capable of, we, we could be doing a lot more. And obviously our community, we often are not getting our patients back home to die as, or dying in the environment that would be, be best for them. Um, and so this is desperately needed and, and how, we, how we look after patients and how we are able to give them a dignified death in our EC is, is something that is a, a big challenge. Um, and so, you know, having family medicine or having uh, people lend a hand or as you've done in George is a good example of the ward rounds and identifying and, and building those connections. It's definitely something that we, we need here, but we obviously have other priorities from the EM side. <laughs> Um, often, um, and, and so outside help or, or advice is, is always welcome. So thank you for your presentation and, and putting together this. And I, I will look at the beginning of the presentation as, as, as part of the recording. Thanks, Luke. Uh, yeah, sorry, I won't respond too long. I know our time is running, but um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think just, just even our emergency medicine ward rounds you know, to, to slowly but surely, and I find it the same on outreach in our district hospitals, more and more, and more the juniors are comfortable when we do a ward round, because the, the first thing is, even if intuitively people realize this patient is end of life, even we know there's cancer or, or what, they, they put up a drip, take blood, and to systematically say, you know what, I, I think you can throw that blood away. Uh, take out that drip or don't put a drip. Um, let's just check the sugar and just, you know, this may be something irreversible. And of course, immediately connect with the family. What was the baseline? Is the, you know, but because once they sort of lie there for a half a day and the family thinks, okay, great, now they're in the hospital, they're in good hands, but then they die in the EC. That's so demoralizing for the patient. Of course, not a great experience and the whole team. But over time, I think with the comfort of knowing there's a home based system. There's a few uh, family med beds in the ward. We, we sort of can move these people. Let, let's quickly give you a bit of morphine, have a conversation, say to the patient, listen, we're losing, we're losing you. You realize that, but we're going to help you. And just like any other patient, within two, three, four hours, shift that patient. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and, and people, have, it's become, okay, great. I can do something. I can do yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as I speak, we have 34 people on chairs in what we call our asthma area and 32 people on trolleys. We're at 300%. And so trying to get a bed for someone who's, who's, who's end of life, I mean, we, we're deprioritizing care for big sections of, of the people in our EC. And I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the only consultant sitting in an EC saying, you know, we should be doing more, but we're struggling. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your time. If I can uh, build on that, Luke, I think um, one of our jobs as a collective is to keep people out of the EC, decongest your EC and, and get those numbers down. Um, and so if you look at the 87% that reason for people attending EC uh, being pain and dyspnea, that as you say, could be dealt with uh, elsewhere. Uh, it means, you know, what are we, what are we telling people um, uh, to expect? You know, if your dyspnea is going to get worse, uh, what are you going to do? You know, is it necessary to actually go to the hospital or not? Uh, if you run out of medication, where's your, you know, how, how are you going to get medication after hours or whatever the issue is? Um, uh, anticipating even uh, um, the time of of dying uh, and saying, you know, how, how are you thinking about this? How are you planning this? This doesn't necessarily mean a visit to the EC. Uh, we can plan this, people have advanced directives, and this is the, 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 the work of community-based palliative care teams uh, is to keep people out of ECs and, and make your job actually uh, feasible, Luke. Um, no, no, I, I hear you. I, I often, I mean, for me, I, I, with those conversations, we were at the end of that line most of the time. Right. Yeah. And um, right. the people who are further upstream um, setting up those processes and, and, you know, obviously it'll help a little bit where we can get some patients out from our side, but um, yeah. you, I'm converted. <laughs> I know, I know, 
yeah, that that we definitely need those patients to be cared for in, in the, a better environment than our EC. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, so that really was the purpose of this seminar. Um, beautifully illustrated. Uh, thank you, Louis. Is to really uh, uh, focus as a as a as a bigger team on on how we address these issues. You presented the the stats. Um, and there's this this huge uh, subjective uh, aspect to both the distress of the patients and their families and the response of the healthcare team um, that uh, that is really quite central to this. You know that distress is driving people into the into the ECs. Where if if we are able to step back and, as you say, um, have those difficult conversations. Um, it could it could really make quite a huge difference to the the burden that you feel in the ECs of of just huge numbers, um, and unable to then give everybody the the quality that they deserve. Uh, we've gone past five o'clock, but last question, Taslim, or comment. So it's it's more comment and maybe something for us to think about in the future. I think this type of qualitative change in practice that Lewis demonstrated uh, requires pretty visionary and inspiring leadership. And I think uh, as, so, so I mean, I we're all equally kind of enthralled by Lewis and his team's uh, achievements, but I think that type of achievement in a, in a very busy context, number one, it, it showed that it's possible, but it need, needed to have some kind of really deep visionary leadership. And I just want to commend Louis on that and his team on that. But it's also uh, kind of highlights the need to have role models who are on the ground, who are able to live a new reality. And, and I think that is a, is a challenge because how do we get critical numbers of, of people or do we just think about making changes within the context in which we operate? Um, the, the, it, it needs, a, it needs a, an approach to training clinical leaders or people who have some kind of influence within workspaces um, to be able to sustain or to kind of expand this type of, of, of change management. Thanks, Louis. Um, Thank last word. Um, I wonder if you could give me back the uh, host uh, function, Louis. Um, yeah, I guess so. I don't share a screen. I don't know how you do that. Uh, give me a second. I'll do that. Oh, uh, can. I, I can just push reclaim and then I'll give it to you, Steve. Okay. Uh, there we go. Uh, there you go, Steve. Thank you. I just want to share the next seminar. Um, which is on the 20, two weeks time on the 26th of October. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this topic. I've been playing around on a PowerPoint slide on caring. What exactly do we mean by care? Um, I hope you can see that slide. I'll put this out with the links, but um, beyond good bedside manner or just being nice. Um, and I'm going to bring in stuff from the medical humanities. So uh, uh, I hope most of you can join us for that. But thanks for joining us this afternoon. And you'll get this in your, in your email. For those of you who joined the MS Teams meeting, remember these seminars are on Zoom. So the Zoom link is usually contained in the, in the, um, the calendar uh, invitation. But thanks everybody. Thank you particularly Louis for an excellent presentation and thanks everyone for, for joining us. Good night. Yeah, bye bye Amon. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.